Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about sequence stratigraphy, an important technique in sedimentary geology, which is further used for reservoir modeling and predicting where your hydrocarbons might be and where other things might be as well. So we've got two things here. So here's a picture of uh, Book Cliffs in Utah, in America, taken on a field trip by myself in 1998. And here's some different uh, relationships between different sequences. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So let's first of all define what stratigraphy is. So stratigraphy is the method of dividing sedimentary rocks into layers. So here's William Smith's geological map of, uh, of England and Wales at Scotland with the different colors representing different uh, rock strata of different ages. So that leads to coherent naming of rock units, which is William Smith in, in the early 19th century was the first person to work that out. So we've got different types of stratigraphy. We've got lithostratigraphy, correlating different rock units, to similar rock type, similar facci, similar to positional environments. Chronostratigraphy, correlating units deposited at the same geological time. William Smith was the first person to work that out. So here's the Jurassic, here's the Cretaceous, here's the Carboniferous, etc. I mean, please check out the map that uh, changed the world by Simon which is a really good book describing that. And biostratigraphy is correlating units with similar fossils, which is what William Smith used to make his map. And stratigraphy started uh, back in the 18th century with the science of geology being uh, codified, it was refined in the 20th century by Wheeler, Sloss, Bush and others. And sequence stratigraphy came along in, in the 1970s when we had uh, really good seismic that we can actually see things, things on and was developed by Vail, Van Wagner and others working mainly for Exxon in the 1970s. So that's what stratigraphy is and we'll talk a little bit about uh, it uh, in more detail. So first of all, depositional environments. Again, this is, gives you an idea. This is just a brief overview. So you've got mountains where uh, materials eroded. You've got rivers depositing alluvial and fluvial sediments and alien sediments within deserts. Then you've got littoral area. You've got deltas coming into the sea. Then you've got uh, shelf. And then you've got deep sea and you've got slope. So these are a few concepts in terms of deposition. And then you've got biostratigraphy, which I'll just mention really briefly because it feeds in with everything else. So this is looking at the fossils within layers, micropaleontology, microorganism, paleontology using fossil plants. You can get quite accurate dating to within a million years or less. And you can use these zones to validate your seismic interpretation, separate potential reservoir zones, correlate potential reservoir zones. And basically, you can also use it for directional drilling uh, on the well site to stay within one layer. For example, the on a slightly larger site, Channel Tunnel was drilled in a specific, uh, between England and France, was drilled in a specific biozone. So again, please talk to specialists around that, but it's just an important concept we just need to briefly introduce. So sequence stratigraphy methods of subdividing sediment rocks by relative positions range and changing sea levels. And changing sea levels are not constant, they move up and down. And you can use the technique to predict petroleum reservoirs, where petroleum reservoirs might be, where the source rocks might be, correlate units uh, relative to each other, making sense of a potentially complex stock record, trying to solve the puzzle, predict sedimentary environments, and can help with complex seismic interpretation, trying to figure out what's going on, how to make it all work. And the sequences are bounded by sequence boundaries, which are erosional surfaces. So when uh, sea level falls, get erosion. And maximum flooding surfaces, when sea level rises to its maximum, and everything, well, well, not quite everything, but pretty much most things are covered up. And it's complementary to using other interpretation methods to put it all together to come up with, this, with a coherent picture. So transgression and regression. So we got regression is when sea level falls. So you got uh, from moving from a high stand to falling system stract. Then at the bottom, you got low stand. Then you got transgressive when sea level rises. And this is sea level through time. So the two curves, Hallam and X on sea level curve. So you are here, sea level is actually relatively low uh, relative to where they, they have been. Sorry, you are here. That's the last glacial episode. Sea levels were considerably higher during the Cretaceous. Um, they were relatively low during the Permian Carboniferous and they were a lot higher during the um, Cam uh, during the uh, Devonian, Silurian, Ordovician and Cambrian. So again, you need to know where they are. And there's uh, a much higher frequency uh, on top of the general low frequency event. So this is the uh, diagram or the exon slug. So I'll just go through this quite briefly. So first of all, you've got a sequence boundary coming through here, marked SB. So that's the erosional surface. So over here, near to the coast, so this coast is this way, deep sea is that way. So you've got uh, erosion, and then you've got deposition in the deep sea, and you've got something called the low stand fan. So turbidite reservoirs, for example. 
then sea level starts going up and you're starting to get uh, the transgressive systems track. So that comes over the low stand, you get sediment piling up, moving here. Eventually, you get maximum flooding surface, which is where you've got sea level covers the uh, most of the area. And then sediment keeps coming over and keeps piling over. You've got something called a high stand systems track. Now sea levels are relatively high and sediments just moving onwards into the, into the, into the deep sea. And then you've got another sequence boundary coming right over the top of that. So that's what it looks like in space, and this is what it looks like in geological time. This is a chronostrat diagram or a Wheeler diagram developed by a man called Wheeler. So this is time, and this is space laterally. So you've got erosional unconformity, and then you've got a bit of deposition on top of the erosional unconformity in the deep sea, and then sediment climbing over to get the maximum flooding surface, greatest cover, and then you've got sediment coming through covering the area and then you've got again another sequence boundary and then the cycle starts over again so sequence boundary at the bottom transgressive system tract coming over the top then uh, maximum flooding surface greater sea level extent then you've got sediment piling in that's the high stand system tract and then you've got the next sequence coming through so that's what it looks like and then you put everything within that context so a little bit of a zoom in. So you've got a sequence boundary at the bottom, erosional surface, start of the cycle, low stand. Then you've got transgressive. So again, sediment coming over, drowning. Maximum flooding surface, greatest extent of drowning. And then prograde's. And you've got sediment coming in, filling in the gaps. When sediment supply comes over the top, still at a relatively high sea level. And this is where things are in terms of sediments. So you've got brown, is the littoral sediments and then yellow is a potential beach sands so that's what you're looking for as a geologist finding in the reservoirs a little bit about predicting reservoir distribution so this is by kendall at uh, morris tucker so again you've got a mixed carbonate and plastic sequence here so again you've got high stand system tracks so you've got these prograde's low stand system track the low stand fans here you have sediments suddenly shutting off so you've got a carbonate factory coming in so you've got a carbonate unit with carbonate with carbonates on the shelf and you've got another high stand system tracks coming over the top. So again, where things are, that's the relative sea level positions. So again, high stands, falling stage systems tract, low stand, sequence boundary, where the sea levels are at the lowest, then transgression, and then high stand coming over after maximum flooding surface. So again, maximum flooding surfaces, sequence boundaries are the two main units. So when you end, uh, Transition regression, this is from Vale, so this is one of the first uh, people who look at sequence stratigraphy. So you've got balanced originals influx. So this is where you have sediment supply basically is um, keeping up with the rise. So effectively, shore, uh, the shore is at a relatively static position geographically. So you've got coastal uh, deposits, then you've got littoral deposits, so that's where the beach sands are, and then you've got marine deposits, so that's where the marine shales are. You will have potentially um, low stand, you know, uh, turbidite fans out in the deep sea, but that's another question. Then you got regression, so you got high terrigenous influx, so you got loads of sediment coming in, and the sediments coming in faster than uh, than the sea levels rising. So again, the shoreline moves out this way. And you got low terrigenous influx, so a, a transgression, so sea levels moving that way, and the beach sands are moving this way, and so dinosaurs are having a little party here. This is from uh, Van Wagner via uh, a chap called Gary Hampson. I very really would recommend his sequence stratigraphy course. He's a lecturer at Imperial College, and he's got most of that on YouTube. So you've got aggregation, so the rate of deposition is keeping up with the um, accommodation space. So everything's pretty much static. So again, that's your beach sands, that's your rich coastal plain, and that's your deeper sea sediment. Then you've got retrogradation. So this is when rate of deposition is less than the accommodation space. So again, the, um, um, the sediment is moving this way, the beach is moving this way, and deep sea is moving this way, and, this, and the relative shoreline is moving to the, uh, to the left. And here you've got progradation. So this is when the rate of deposition is greater than the accommodation space and sediment is coming in and everything is moving basinward. And these are what the signatures look like on logs. So these individual units, individual sequences with sand at the top. 
This is uh, distinctive log patterns. This is uh, when you have a retrogradational system. This is where you have a progradational system. So again, looking at log signature helps you try to understand where you are. So what does it look like on seismic? So here's a seismic section. Uh, was posted by somebody on the internet. You've got this big black event here, which is a maximum flooding service. Generally, it tends to be a shale, tends to be a bit of a soft kick, so they tend to be quite uh, relatively easy to see. Then you have prograde's. So you have uh, falling state system tract, high system tract, transgressive system tract. This is a log. So these are your your prograde's. Then you've got another maximum flooding surface, and then you've got the top top event here. So again. You can see some of these things. You can see some of the low stand fans. You can see some of the progress on seismic. This is what enabled people to, to think about where things were. So what does it look like on seismic in terms of terminal events? So here's at the top. So this is uh, an erosional surface. So you have younger units in here. This is actually cut again. So this is your sequence boundary. And this is erosionally truncating these relatively flat events here. When you're coming into uh, into prograde, so you have something called top lab. So these are units where you're prograding out to the basin. During your transgressive system tract, you have something very 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 uh, distinctive called on lap. So these are units basically coming inwards towards the base towards the shoreline, but uh, basically filling in the basin. And you've got these units coming in here, terminating against a, a previous uh, unit. You've got down lap, so this is again you're coming into the deeper deeper uh, basin. You've got these prograde's, these events coming in, filling in uh, deeper down. So this is where you've got um, down lap and on lap doing your transgressive system tract. Then you're going to do your low stand, and then you're going to maximum flooding surface coming on here, and that's all comes onto a sequence boundary. Looking at what it looks like on logs, you can use this to correlation. So you can correlate different units, so effectively your red and blue diamond shapes. So sequence boundaries are where uh, units are at the widest, like here, and it narrows as the maximum flooding surface. And the maximum flooding surface is sometimes associated with biozones, so for example, the Glacense maximum flooding surface in the Jurassic and North Sea. And you can see where these things are, and you can use that to correlate individual units. Correlating individual units is fairly important. So this example, again, uh, posted by Gary Hampson, and this is uh, from Van Dagen et al. So if you're looking at using pure lithostratigraphy, just using units, well, that unit looks like that one, 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 well, why don't you just join them all up? But in reality, it's not quite like that, because when you look at the different uh, biozo uh, chronozones, uh, quite often backed up by biostratigraphy, you can see that unit one, uh, not quite the same. Okay, this looks the same because it's the same facies, similar facies, but it's not the same time. So this unit here might well not talk to this unit here or talk to this unit here. So if you're looking at it over an oil field, for example, you know, talking tens of kilometers, uh, you know, 20, 30 kilometers, you're trying to put an injector well, a production well, two are going to talk to each other. So you want to know that. Also, if you're looking at potential uh, distribution of potential reservoir units, well, this particular age time, you won't find any reservoir units here, but you will find them at this, at this time. So again, sequence stratigraphy helps you make sense of what's going on. So sum up, uh, it's revolutionized sedimentary geology since 1970s. Helps geologists understand better relationships with different sedimentary units. Well, why is this important? Well, it helps you predict possible reservoirs. Where could we potentially get a reservoir? And that helps with exploration. You can understand where the source rocks might be, particularly when you're going into a brand new basin. Um, you want to predict where the source rocks might be, so you can try to model them. You can try to understand what your risk of actually finding hydrocarbons in the first place might be. Also helps you your seal uh, and cap rock prediction. Again, I've got a video on seals and how they work, but again, that's a very important factor, quite often overlooked, but important and vital to do that. Helps you correlate units within individual field development settings. So again, try and understand where you are. So this is Book Cliffs Util. So this is a field trip we had back in 1998. Um, I'm on the left here. This is one of the cliffs. And Book Cliffs is where Van Wagen et al. developed the whole concept of sequence stratigraphy. If you are in Utah, I would really recommend visiting the place, particularly also visiting Moab, particularly visiting Eddie McStiff's beer bar and uh, brewery and, uh, and pizza parlor. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe. I'll see you on the next one.